Ladies and gentlemen, how do you say Kevin Mila in an Eastern Shore accent? Well, the first baseman soon to find out as today the free agent officially sends his chowda back to the kitchen and places an order for Maryland crab cakes. Well, in a city known for its NFL Jaguars, today the South Alabama Jaguars were held to a dull roar as they had their teeth cut by a much sharper gang of Gators, all the while leaving defenses and media members in his wake. This morning, however, the lightning quick Noel Devine finally slowed down, allowing the rest of us to catch up. Good evening, everyone, from Germain Arena, home of the Florida Everblades, and also home to a house of whores. If we learned anything today, it's that we're going to leave all things basketball related to guys like Joe Kim Noah and Lee Humphrey. After all, the Gators have done pretty well so far. And welcome back to Dolphins Stadium, where for the second straight year, the Orange Bowl has given us a rather juicy affair. Good evening, everyone, and once again, it's time to talk towels. The Jermaine Arena faithful waving their wares this evening. But for those of the Gators that are here now, well, they're soon to be going right there. Minneapolis for this Sweet 16, where Florida hasn't been since 2000. Good evening, everyone. Attendance at tonight's Fort Myers Miracle Game, precisely 885. But amongst the warm bodies piling into Hammond Stadium, only one belongs to the big boss. This week, Minnesota Twins general manager Terry Ryan keeping tabs on his team by taking his annual trip down to southwest Florida. So how does the head honcho grade his single-A squad? Some of these guys will take a step forward and... Some guys might take a little bit of a step backwards, but it's a we've got a nice club here. I'm very encouraged about what I see to this point. And under the watchful eye of the Diamond Dictator, could the Miracle live up to their reputation hosting the Sarasota Reds? Bottom five, two-zip Miracle when Matt Tolbert shoots a shot to left just over the glove of the Reds outfielder. Both Alexi Casilla and Garrett Guzman score home squad. Up four zip and the hits keep on coming. Still in the fifth, Jeremy Pickrell down the line, grabs some chalk and stays in play. Another run scores, much to Ryan's delight. Miracle go up five zip, they win by that final. Now here's where Ryan's real concern is. The Twins beginning the evening in second to last place in the AL Central. 11 and a half games back of the first place Tigers. Tonight the Twinkies out in La La Land right now. Tied at two with the Halos, this one is in the fourth more MLB in. As we know, the devil is in the details and for the time being, it'll also be in Tampa. Today, the Devil Rays announced that they'll be staying with their diabolic moniker at least through next season. Dropping the devil had been being discussed. Meanwhile, this evening, the last place Rays continuing their hellish yeah, season the visiting the Orioles. Rays down 6-4 in the eighth. Let's get a little closer. Aubrey Huff with a solo shot that cuts the lead to one. Rays still with a pulse. Top nine, Greg Norton with a man on and this would tie the ball game. Looking long for the two run blast. Oh, Corey Patterson, he's going to see some charges of grand Larson and he robbing Norton of a two run homer that ends the frame and the game O's win 7 5 is your final and from the Rays to the Jays Toronto welcoming Boston Josh Beckett on the hill and he did not have his best stuff bottom one Vernon Wells same frame Troy Gloss then in the third it's Wells then Gloss again in the fifth you are sensing the theme here Gloss and Wells combined for five homers and six ribbies Beckett just four and two thirds innings pitch he drops to seven and two Jays win it 8-5 NL now and over the weekend the Florida Marlins celebrate Jewish Heritage Day by giving away Mike Jacobs t-shirts. Good plan, poor execution. Here's your problem. Mike Jacobs is not Jewish. Apparently unfazed by the clerical confusion, Jacobs went two for four with a homer in a 5-1 fish win over the Giants. Tonight the Marlins again hosting the G-men Barry Bonds in uniform just not in the lineup. Miguel Cabrera, though, doing his best Bonds impersonation. A three-run blast to the third. Career homer number 87 for Cabrera. So he's got a ways to go if he wants to catch Bonds. But the fish up 4-1. So we go to the ninth. Florida up 5-2. Things tighten up. Lance Negro deep off Joe Burkowski. It cuts the lead to 5-3. But Burkowski would get Jose Vizcaino to end it. Fish have won 6 of 8. 5-3 tonight's final from Miami. More from Miami. The Heat are on the verge of melting the men from Motown. Thanks to Monday's fourth quarter explosion, Miami has hardcore Heat fans all fired up about what would potentially be the franchise's first trip to the NBA Finals. After grabbing the Bulls by the horns and cutting down the nets, Miami now stands within one win of passing the Pistons. It's the fifth game, you know, these conference finals. We know what to do. We have seen, you know, um, what it looked like when we do it right. Um, so I just go out there and do it. We know it's going to be a dog fight, and uh, we got to be 
ready to play, and we can we got to expect it. That team has a lot of pride, and I got a lot of respect for the Detroit Pistons. Well, it's going to take more than pride to pull the Pistons out of this position, perhaps down to their final game. As we said, Miami leads the best of seven series 3-1. Game five from Motown tips tomorrow night, and we're right back after this. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Dolphin Stadium. Number 22, Florida State. Number three, Penn State, each enjoying the fruits of their labor in the Orange Bowl. However, when you take a look at the coaches on the sideline for this esteemed matchup, you might want to think about a different fruit, perhaps a prune. Together, these two coaches, more than 70 decades of head coaching D1 experience. Now, when you listen to the two of them talk about each other, you get the idea that their friendly rivalry goes back almost as long. There are certain guys you like to be around with. There are certain guys you rather not be around with. So, you know, Joe and I are very much alike. He just Yankee, you know. <laughs> hey, remember you? You were at West Virginia for what, 12 years? Oh, yes. 13 years. <laughs> oh, let's go down. You know, I've always kind of used Joe as a gauge. You know, Joe's a couple of years older than I am, and you know, we're both. We both want to do the same thing. We both have reached the age where, uh, where it, it, when, when things go bad, the first thing is too old, too old, over the hill. Everybody wants to know how long you're going to go. Well, I probably would think about it if somebody, if my grandkids would leave me alone. You know, every time I start to sit up by myself and, you know, maybe uh, start to think about uh, what I want to, you know, when I'm going to die, some nine-year-old kid comes in and starts telling me, hey, how come you didn't do this in the last game? <laughs> well, when Joe Pa's getting coaching advice from his grandkids, it gives you a pretty good idea exactly how long he's been in Happy Valley. Same story for Bobby Bowden in Tallahassee. Neither of these coaching legends short on the experience edge. We're talking, as we said, 70 years combined at each of their current institutions. Let's go ahead and take a look at a graphic we made. We're calling this one the tail of the tape. One for the age. Joe Paterno recently celebrating his 79th birthday. Bobby, a spring chicken at a mere 76. But Coach Bowden has the edge in career wins at 359. These two, number one and number two on the all-time list. Also, the top two in bowl wins. Joe Pa, the edge there, 20 to 19. Bobby can tie him tonight. And you see Pa, the extreme edge in head-to-head, -head, winning six of seven meetings. However, that one W did come on this very field back in the 1990 Blockbuster Bowl. Now, of course, back then, that field was called Joe Robbie. Now it's Dolphin Stadium, and as if that's not fishy enough, rather conspicuously, we're joined right now by Jim Reeve. Jim, of course, ABC7 chief meteorologist, perhaps equally as famous, a rabid Penn State alum, Penn State fan, and I understand you have someone with you tonight who knows a thing or two about Penn State prognostications. Absolutely, Jason. All right, Jim, you know what I appreciate? I understand you're on your day off, but I got to put you on the spot. The weather for tonight's game. Absolutely perfect. Clear skies, temperatures in the low 70s, shirt sleeve weather. You heard it here first. Beautiful weather for a football game at the Orange Bowl Dolphin Stadium. Of course, join us after the game on ABC. We'll have a full live report, full highlights right after the ball game. Number 22, Florida State. Number three, Penn State. For now, I'm Jason Kurtz reporting live from the Orange Bowl. ABC 7 Sports we will send it back to you. Good evening, everyone. The man responsible for orchestrating that magical moment and many more for the Minnesota Twins and their fans has passed away. Earlier this evening, Kirby Puckett died due to complications resulting from a stroke suffered Sunday. The 45-year-old Hall of Famer was given last rites at St. Joseph's Hospital and Medical Center in Phoenix, Arizona. Puckett had been in intensive care since undergoing surgery for bleeding in the brain. Now the twins are currently up in Tampa preparing for tomorrow's grapefruit game with the Yankees. However, this evening we caught up with team general manager Terry Ryan at the Lee County Sports Complex in Fort Myers to get his thoughts on Puckett's passing. This is a tough day for this organization and not only the people that follow the twins, but also national baseball fans. We lost an icon in the game and a great person on the field. And one of those guys you like to be around off the field, he just made everybody feel good about themselves. 
Meanwhile, from up in Minnesota, Twins owner Carl Polad had this to add, saying, This is a sad day for the Minnesota Twins, Major League Baseball, and baseball fans everywhere. Eloise and I loved Kirby deeply. Kirby's impact on the Twins organization, state of Minnesota, and upper Midwest is significant and goes well beyond his role in helping the Twins win two world championships. A tremendous teammate, Kirby will always be remembered for his never-ending hustle, infectious personality, trademark smile, and commitment to the community. There will never be another puck and puck was certainly one of a kind with a never ending motor and a never ending smile for a dozen years. He carried a city and a franchise on his five foot eight inch frame, leading the twins to a pair of World Series championships in 1987 and 91. He finished his career as a 318 hitter with more than a thousand runs scored and batted in controlling the vast space in the Metrodome outfield. Puck had reeled in six gold gloves and earned invites to 10 all star games. A first ballot Hall of Famer Puckett's career was cut short by eye damage and now just 10 years later his life has been cut short as well. However, the impact he had on those he shared a clubhouse with will live on. Kirby's done done so much for uh, baseball in the upper Midwest, let alone baseball throughout the uh, the world. I had the uh, the joy of playing with him, uh, you know, in 95. That was my rookie year and you know, and uh, that was his last year. And uh, you know, it's just a lot of memories. You know, he's uh, you know he's one of a kind. It's just uh, something you don't want to see. He tried to play the game the right way, each and every every day he was out there. And I got to see him play every game. So how lucky was I? The Twins spent this afternoon in Bradenton taking on the Pirates, a contest they lost 5-4. to four. At 3-3 three and three overall, Minnesota will meet the Yankees in Tampa tomorrow at 1.15 p.m. The Twins next return to Hammond Stadium on a Wednesday for a day game with the Reds. Now, as of now, no plans have specifically been made to honor the legendary center fielder, but anyone who had the pleasure and privilege of watching Puck play was indeed lucky, as Tom Kelly said. Kirby Puckett, a 10-time All-Star, a two-time world champion, a Hall of Famer, dead at the age of 45. Hey, it's beautiful, Noah, and here I am high atop the beautiful city of Jacksonville. You know, Jacksonville, a bit of a sleepy city today. Not a single game going on. All four teams that won yesterday, including Florida, will play tomorrow. Now, those four winning teams held closed-door practices today, but while all the arena and all the basketball operations were shut down, that left the rest of the city wide open for us. Three twenty Friday afternoon, 24 hours away from the game. No game today, only tomorrow and yesterday. So what else is there to do on this St. Patrick's Day off day? Well, how about a beverage? Most people think in green. I think blue and orange. Barkeep, fix me up a gator cocktail. Mm, looks good, but actually, I'm still on the clock. So no basketball on the plate today, but there is something else on the plate, sir. Don't be shy to have yourself a few wings. I've had plenty of wings. Go Gators. My four sophomores and my freshmen are going to kick some butt. On Thursday, Florida's Joe Kim Noah took advantage of much smaller competition. He'll try to do the same thing tomorrow against the University of Milwaukee. <laughs> Gator fans hoping he's going to have a little more success than I did. And if the inside game's not your speed, the Gators have been awful good from deep as well. On Thursday against South Alabama, Lee Humphrey set a record with six three-pointers. That's a Gator high for an NCAA tournament game. Ooh. Guess we're gonna have to leave that one to the Gators as well. One day I was just getting out of the shower and I was drying myself off and, it found, and I found a, a lump and I was like, that's, that's not good. While most high school students spend their summers taking it easy, Justin Miners spent his taking on cancer. Well, uh, it's basically uh, what Lance Armstrong has, uh, testicular cancer. Uh, what happened, I had to get an operation, I had to get, uh, I had to get uh, my left testicle taken out because it was cancer filled. And for Armstrong, comfort came atop two wheels. Miners, though, began spinning his own two legs, going out for the Palmetto Ridge cross country team less than two months after going under the knife. I mean, I was stuck in the house for five weeks, four weeks recovering, 
and I was like, I gotta get, I gotta get some, I gotta get out there, I gotta train, I gotta do something. So I just started coming to these practices. Like, so you know, I was on the team. He's not our number one runner, but he provides inspiration to our number one runners, both boys and girls. And it's just great to have a kid who, without trying and without wearing it on his shirt and bragging to everybody, I beat cancer. He doesn't do that. He just does what he's supposed to do every day. He works as hard as he can. My my passion, like I want to, I want to beat this race. I want to do good in this race. You know, I want to, you know, it just it just helps that trying to finish the race more. You know, Justin, you've overcome cancer, a 3.1 mile race. That's nothing. Justin is new to cross country, but he's not new to competition. Yes. Yes. We just had a meet actually a while ago and he ran all the way and he looked like he was going to pass out, but he kept on going. And so Justin will keep going, one foot in front of the other, knowing that the path in front will never be as challenging as the uphill climb he's already conquered. It's one thing to be the best back on your team or in your district, even in your own state. But to be touted as the top tailback talent in all the USA. He's, he's pretty good. I think he's pretty good. Well, this type of acclaim and accolade doesn't arrive without a whole lot of attention. I know all these um, people are going to be here. Oh, but people will always be here. People from the offices of the New York Times and people with the pages of Sports Illustrated, all to do what defenses cannot, catch hold of a young man drawing comparisons to Barry Sanders and Reggie Bush. A young man who runs the football with such an angelic grace, it seems he's powered by something far stronger than 170 pounds of sculpted musculature. Instead, perhaps, by some sort of divine intervention. The name is Noel Devon, the face has been hidden for much of the dynamic career. The voice, more often than not, is a mere mumble. I just feel good, I just feel blessed. I'm getting all that attention on me. This summer's photo shoot for Florida football's first ever issue becomes our first chance to get up close and personal with a young man equal parts gifted and guarded. <laughs> no modeling, just football player, whatever, whatever I become. But this football player carries much more than a 14 ounce piece of pigskin. He carries a memory of a friend slain before his eyes. He carries the spirit of two parents dead of AIDS. I feel sorry for Noel. He's, he's a young, young boy, or I'm sorry, a young man. And uh, you, you know what? He doesn't need to be going through this. And my main concern is for him, you know, just like he needs to have a normal childhood years, high school years, as the rest of his teammates. Outside of his football coach, the closest Devines come to a father figure came in the form of former NFL star and fellow Red Knight, Deion Sanders. Come on. I'm teaching him how to handle the media. That's why he's standing beside me. So I tell him to open his mouth, talk loudly and properly, and have a good time. Right? Yes, sir. See, he's chewing gum. See, he's chewing gum. That's one thing we don't do with the media. We don't chew gum while we're talking. There we go. Prime time and Devine. It seemed the perfect match, and all in the very public eye. He's been like a dad to me. I just look up to him like as a dad. It's like being great for him to take me in and adopt me. But as high profile was the adoption, it was equally short-lived, as Devine later landed back in southwest Florida and will finish out his schoolboy career on fields previously worn thin by the likes of Sanders, Philadelphia Eagle Javon Kurse, and former Major League Baseball All-Star Mike Greenwell. But amongst the big names to precede Divine, one wonders if the biggest legacy won't be left by the student athlete's smallest in stature. Divine's 5 foot 8 inch frame has an open invitation to grace campuses across the Sunshine State and as far west as the cornfields of Nebraska and the beaches of Southern California. For the time being, though, he lives and plays in a bubble. Well, I mean, I'm going to be honest, it's tough. I mean, it's even tough for me. Both our phones don't stop. Um, you know, he's, he's still a teenage kid, and uh, he's just trying to be you know, a good citizen, a good football player. The latter seems to have already been accounted for, as Devine's stat page seems NCAA ready. Almost 5,000 total yards, some 50-plus career touchdowns. 
However, it's his ACT numbers that are still in doubt. To help pave a path that lands at the next level, the team phenom will rely on the support of his teammates, coaches, and the community. They say it takes a village to raise a child. Let's hope Noel Devine can continue to grow. In Fort Myers, I'm Jason Kurtz.